Welcome to the HANA RN Center's virtual reading group. My name is Samantha Hill. I'm the assistant director of the HANA RN Center here at Bard College. And we are in the middle of Rahel Varnhagen, um, HANA RN's strange pseudo-biography of the life of a Jewish woman. Um, so I just want to um, bring up one point before we jump into the middle of our conversation. Um, a couple of people have pointed out that uh, there are different versions of the Varnhagen text that we're using, so it makes it a little difficult sometimes to find the passages that we're sharing with one another. So we were thinking, um, perhaps as we go through, that we could number the paragraphs in each chapter and just say what paragraph um, we're talking about as we're reading so everyone can find it in their various versions of the text. So today we're looking at chapter four, Flight Abroad, The Beautiful World, and chapter five, Magic, Beauty, and Folly. Um, so, um, you know, chapter four, just paragraph one. If that sounds good to everyone, it'll make it a little easier. Um, and maybe we could just, moving forward in the future, take the time as we read to number as we go through. That sound good? I see some nods. <laughs> okay, so I was struck by a few things as I was reading through chapter four and five. I think this might be the biggest chunk of reading that we've had so far in the Varnhagen text. Um, and it was, it felt kind of mesmerizing to get lost in these two chapters as I was reading through. Um, I was, I continue to be struck by the tone of Arendt's language um, in describing uh, Varnhagen's life events. I feel like another name for these two chapters might have been more men in the lives of Rachel Varnhagen and the many disappointments she encountered. Um, <laughs> this poor woman cannot seem to find love, uh, something I'm sure none of us can relate to. But Arendt's <laughs> judgments of Varnhagen um, are, I think, somewhat striking. But philosophically, um, we get in these two chapters a discussion of a central, a central topic in Western political philosophy um, that, and to my knowledge, Arendt really doesn't spend time talking about anywhere else in great depth, and that's beauty. Um, and what is beauty and what is the role of beauty in constellating Rahel Varnhagen's life and the experiences um, that she's having in this kind of Sisyphean quest to find herself outside of herself. So in chapter four, in Flight Abroad, The Beautiful World, Varnhagen is going to leave Berlin and go to Paris. Paris, that eternal city, city where all great writers and thinkers seem to go to feel more like themselves by escaping themselves. Um, it was difficult not to think of some of Baldwin's pronouncements on leaving America and feeling more comfortable um, beyond the place of his birth um, in Arendt's description of Varnhagen going to Paris. So in, I'm in, this edition, and I'm on page 69, um, but it's, let's see, I didn't number my, I didn't number my own paragraphs ahead of time as I was reading, um, but she starts talking about happiness and unhappiness, and it's one, two, three, four, um, on the top of page 67 in paragraph four, um, Arendt writes, she fled abroad from Berlin because she could no longer endure the disgrace. She's lost her hope. Um, because she was condemned to go on living, to enjoy every new day with the natural innocence of all creatures. But it was no longer innocence when one knew thoroughgoing unhappiness, when anguished by grief, humiliation, in despair, one would gladly give up life in order not to be capable of pain when one has thought everything, all of nature, cruel. Natural as gladness was, it had become inappropriate, a pleasure she could no longer allow herself, to which she merely 
succumbed and then down the bottom unhappiness brought disgrace right and so she's you know weaving she's weaving Varnhagen here with her own reading and, and filling it out but I was struck by the way that she talks about this perspective of innocence that one loses as they go through life and I think it resonates with the way that Arendt later comes to talk about what it means to love the world and to see the world um, as it is and so she's describing Varnhagen here as losing her innocence as succumbing to this despair this degree grief humiliation um, through these failed romances through these failed attempts at escaping her position in the world. And when one loses this innocence, one loses their ability to, I want to say in a certain sense, suffer, right? When you've been so exposed to pain, when you realize the extent to which life can bring grief down on you, then happiness loses the the joys of innocent happiness disappear right you can never experience happiness fully as um, something that is untainted by suffering that exists in the world um, reminds me a bit of Nietzsche and talking about how one needs the suffering if they're going to embrace the happiness but so how does Rahel decide to get on with Livy, and well, she decides that she has to love again, okay? Um, and on page 68, so in paragraph five, six, seven, in the bottom of page seven, when she's thinking about her position in the world, um, Arendt offers a little distinction between truth and opinion, um, which I think is, is useful. Um, she says, the world was full of opinions and truth did not become visible simply because someone cried it aloud into the world of opinions. Who was going to distinguish between opinion and truth? The truth and I, both not visible, both lackluster. In the world of opinions, and this is Arendt now, the truth itself was only an opinion. It was lackluster. That was why the world had mistreated her. Okay. I think this, you know, this resonates with the way that Arendt comes to think about the distinction between truth and opinion and the essays online and politics and, and her later writing and thinking about the way that truth presents itself in the world. And it raises an interesting question of judgment about how one is to distinguish between truth and opinion um, and how one can distinguish between truth and opinion when they feel unrecognized by the world right um, so Rachel goes to Paris and then I want to just I want to spend a couple minutes talk looking at these passages um, about beauty a few of the a couple of the passages about beauty um, so she's talking on page 71 here about melancholy and travel. And she says that, she says, loving life is easy when you are abroad, where no one knows you and you hold your life in your hands all alone. You are more master of yourself than at any other time. In the opacity of foreign places, all specific references to yourself are blurred. It is easy to conquer unhappiness when the general knowledge that you are unhappy is not there to disgrace you. And she goes on, but she offers, it's, I'm always struck by what a spatial thinker Arendt is, but the way that she's talking about loving life here um, and how easy it is to love life and conquer one's own unhappiness when they're traveling implies a sort of distance, which is provided by space when we leave our homeland, when we leave our place of birth when we physically remove ourselves from the environment where we have our lives, where we have built up our lives and we're surrounded by all of the things that give us a sense of place. And so there's a kind of irony in Rahel going to Paris um, and in Arendt's 
um, description of being able to conquer one's own unhappiness, um, that she had to physically uproot herself, um, not through love directly, right, which is what she's been trying, but now she has to find a way to move. Um, and this movement um, allows her to become fuller somehow. And then she talks about, Arendt talks about beauty here as a kind of power. And she talks about it in a way that gives one a sense for the material pleasures of daily life, which can be more easily experienced when we're not at home in the world. Um, she says, forgiveness is good to submerge, to be one, to have no name, nothing that serves as a reminder, and thus to experiment, to try out, to see what things can still give pleasure, right? To avoid blows, to be without pretensions, to lose yourself in all the beautiful things of this world. It is possible, possible to fall in love with so many things, right? with beautiful vases, beautiful weather, beautiful people. All beauty has power, all things of the world have a character and can be beautiful. All things of the world have a character and can be beautiful. Lovely weather and climate is the most beautiful thing on earth. This is a true God. Out of a lovely summer day, even happiness can emerge. A holy, unexpected happiness for someone who always expected it to come only from human beings. I think we have a real argument for beauty and in relationship to aloneness, right? At the end of Origins, Arendt draws a sharp distinction between solitude and loneliness. And I think this description of being alone here is a, is a different, it's a different side of Arendt's description of solitude is how I read part of her description of beauty. And the way in which solitude can be experienced in the world, and not just in the private realm, but can be experienced in the world when we liberate ourselves from the material and social bondage of our home. And we feel ourselves to be out in the world, untethered by the material trappings of daily life then we can experience, we can appreciate life, we can find beauty in life, and there's something, there's something redemptive in that solitude. Um, I think this has been some, for me, this was some of the nicest writing um, in Varnhagen. Um, and then in the next chapter, <clears throat> in five, just to draw your attention to another, um, and she's talking about her relationship with Gens, um, on page 80, 80, 89, she expands on this concept of the beautiful. And she says on the bottom of page 88, by its very nature, the beautiful is isolated from everything else, right? So we have this idea of, and for Arun, of the beautiful being something that's not social, right? But something that is by definition cut off. Um, for beauty, no road leads to reality, right? To be sure, the beauty of a poem can provide the inspiration for endless meditation, but this meditation is tied to the magic of the moment and has neither past nor future. A beautiful evening is not the evening of a day and is not a symbol for anything. Perhaps it is evening itself, even without day or night, but always day and night come to spoil the beauty of the evening and only language only language with its capacity for giving names to beauty preserves the evening in an eternal present. So we have this idea of the beautiful, something that's isolated from everything else, but we also have this idea that the beautiful in that isolation is cut off from the reality, right? Um, and it's interesting that Arendt ties beauty to this loving of life in the world in a way that relies upon isolation, I think, and not of plurality. And it's a movement in her thinking over time, perhaps, or maybe it's just specific to her understanding of Varnhagen. But it's, 
it something that I think remains in Arendt's writing over time is this idea that it's language that is able to capture that which is passing, even a moment in time. Um, and that it's the language which has capacity for preserving a moment as something eternally. Um, so I've been talking for about 15 minutes. Um, I think that I will stop there. Um, I was most struck by the concept of beauty in these two chapters, in addition to the ongoing saga of Varnhagen's love life. Um, I know Roger is also here. I don't know if you want to jump in and offer some additional opening remarks. Um, hello, everyone, and hi, Sam. Uh, I, no, I, I, I think uh, I'll, I guess what I, I guess I'll say one short thing, which is that um, I, I, I too was. Uh, focused on her her discussion of beauty, um, I think uh, it's it's important for me to to see beauty as um, in its connection to reality. Um, I mean, I've I've really found this book incredibly uh, important in my reading of Arendt, um, uh, and. If if I could give it one mantra or one title overall, it would be the flight from reality, um, <laughs> uh, which is which is um, an idea that is uh, central to so much of Arendt's work um, in 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 the origins of totalitarianism. The whole premise of ideology and totalitarianism is that it's a flight from reality, uh, a flight from a reality which is unbearable. And that there's a deep human need to tell a coherent story to make reality bearable. And um, and and much of the human condition is uh, is is told as a flight from reality, um, the flight from the reality of um, the rise of secularism and science and the meaninglessness of the world, the loss of common sense, and um, our retreat back into our internal selves, uh, away from the common world into ourselves. And if you read Rahel and then you read the sections on common sense in the human condition, in setting paragraphs 35 through 38 or 39, I mean, it's like no time passed. Um, she's talking about introspection in both and the turn away from the common world into introspection. And here again in this chapter on magic, beauty, and folly, um, we're seeing uh, a turn away from the world. Gens is the worldly figure, right? And, uh, and Rahel is the, is the figure who um, will not yield to reality. Um, when Rahel met Jens, she already knew pleasure and the beautiful world. To yield without reserve to reality did not lie within her power. I mean, she it, she is the aunt, she is the the epitome of the person who flees reality, flees her Jewishness, flees her powerlessness, flees her ugliness, you know, whatever you want to call it, her disgrace, and finds a kind of beauty in thinking in an imaginary world in a coherent world and um and then in these moments of magic and again and then she says you know a couple pages later this is in magic beauty folly in the paragraph beginning at this time rahel made an acquaintance of the handsome secretary don rafael de quo and she says ever since she had met Gens, reality had been tempting her again i mean it's like it's a constant battle to flee reality for her. And beauty, the beautiful, which is isolated from everything real, Arendt says, the beautiful is isolated from everything else. Um, he was captivated not by beauty, but by reality, namely Gens. And she is captivated by the beautiful, the magic of the moment, which takes you out of reality um, and enchants you. Uh, and, and it's this struggle 
for someone like Rahel to free herself from reality, um, which I think of as the, I've come to see as the theme of this book. And it's interesting because if you think about Aaron, so much of her work is about the need to confront reality, the need not to flee reality, the need to uh, develop common sense and not simply um, introspection. And so Rahel becomes sort of the original anti-hero of so much of Arendt's thinking, if I understand it correctly. Um, and maybe the hero, insofar as we remember that the book is going to end with Rahel saying that the greatest misfortune was actually my greatest fortune, her return to reality. Um, and so uh, in that sense, um, I found, I continue to find this book um, really rich and meaningful within the larger context of RN's writing and corpus. I'll stop yeah, I I, just, I I think anti-hero is a good way to think about Rahel, um, and you sense Arendt's antagonism through the judgments she casts, weaving together the passages from Rahel's um, letters and papers. Um, and she at some point she says, you know, she the she, that Gens was simply a beautiful object. And I think it's interesting that beauty, which is one of these classic philosophical ideals, um, you know, and is usually located outside the material realm of human affairs, um, becomes the kind of superpower, in a way, of the anti-hero, where Rahel sees even people as beautiful objects to possess. Um, beauty loses, you know, she's caught up in the fantasy of, of the beautiful and of the beautiful life, and it's isolating. She's not capable of forming real bonds with the men that she encounters or anyone else. She's isolated by her desire for the beautiful. And just, Yeah, and I'll just point out that I don't know if you guys all felt this way or not, but Gens comes a fascinating character. Um, yeah. Someone who's not conservative and yet respects the world as it is, uh, loves liberal, is liberal in many ways, and yet um, the liberals don't like him because he, he respects authority, and the conservatives don't like him because he He's not conservative. Um, okay, he's got an anti-Semitic streak, um, but there's a there's a sort of I mean there's I think undoubtedly a um, a certain respect that Arendt has for Gens, and in many ways there's a way and I think there's ways in which he's a model for her. Um, uh, a, not a conservative who respects authority, but someone who, um, uh, you know, can both and enters the world. I mean, she's not going to enter the world in that way. But I think at this time, early in her life, she finds that very um, appealing. I don't know if people found that or not. I, I was struck by the positive portrayal of someone like Gens in, in the book. On, on page 84 and 85 in this, in Magic, Beauty, Folly, um, right when, when Rahel meets Gens, Aaron says she already knew pleasure in the beautiful world. To yield without reserve to reality did not lie within her power. The world would not accept her. After all, she was not free to renounce her freedom. She was not free to renounce her freedom in favor of something else. Um, you know, it's almost this excuse that Rahel, uh, because she didn't feel at home in the world, she, uh, she renounced the world and put, she wanted the, 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 the pleasure of the beautiful world. 
Um, and then our, there's, it's just in about this page and a half here, I think, where she talks about, not just about um, Gens's anti-Semitism and the way Rahel is able to kind of paper over it in, in her appreciation for Gens, but then she also talks about, um, she talks about the Berlin, Berlin Jewish society. Um, and she's talking about Britano and on, on page 85, um, and the, the, so, I mean, I think it goes back to the beginning of the book and the kind of, some of the larger questions about assimilation that we've been talking about through, um, our conversations where his complaint against the Jews was not for failing to assimilate. He attacked them in toto. He emphasized that he was speaking not of this or that Jew, nor of any Jewish individual, but of Jews in general, of Jews everywhere and nowhere. He recognized no distinction between cultivated, even, even, even baptized Jews and other Jews. The Jews who no longer displayed any outward differences, who to prove their culture publicly eat pork on Shabbos and on the promenades, learning Kizaveta's logic by heart were to him more typical than Kaftan Jews. This type of thinking, expressed though it was in a disgusting, rabble-rousing manner, made a great impression upon Gens, even though he respected and loved Rachel dearly, and, and not only Gens. And then down in the next paragraph at the bottom, Arendt, Arendt's talking about assimilation, and she says, the same was true even at Bertano, the Berlin Jews consider themselves exceptions, and just as every anti-Semite knew his personal exceptional Jews in Berlin, so every Berlin Jew knew at least two Eastern Jews in comparison, It's frozen for my end. Uh, you're back. Did I jump out? Yeah, you I were just talking about the how each Jew knew two. Uh, awesome. Two Eastern. I just said I wrote I wrote Eichmann in the margin there because the you know aren't thinking about the assimilation and the way the assimilationist logic moved into the Jewish community itself and influenced the way that the Jewish people were judging one another by replicating these forms of anti-Semitism that created these distinctions of exceptionalism um, seems, I think, is, is part of what she was taken to task for in Eichmann and some of the judgments she made against the Jewish people. It's a similar kind of logical move she's making there. Um, yeah, and obviously this language is is language that appears again in in numerous texts, not to mention Origins, the Jew in general, in her analysis of of some anti-Semitism. I mean, this interestingly enough, Grattenhauer, um, who, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't appear in Origins, although I, I won't stake my, <laughs> I just don't remember it. Um, she suggests here that. This was the first pamphlet of um, of the new anti-Semitism. I, I don't know if that's accurate or not. Uh, in fact, it doesn't. I don't think she makes that same claim in the origin. So maybe she came up with more research. But um, it, here, it's it, it's it's offered as that, and uh, it's clearly language that is picked up and becomes central to to the right to the idea of anti-semitism she she does cite grattenauer and the pamphlet oh, on page 61 of origins okay. um and uh she just says that it was why it, i just looked it up um it was widely read um and has been preceded as far back as 1791 by another um called uber die physische und moralische verfassung der heutigen juden um so that's over the physical and moral constitution of the Jews in German. Yeah, so I mean, she obviously found something else earlier when she was doing research for origins, but um, yeah. it would be, uh, for those interested in beginnings of anti-Semitism, going back to some of these panels, these pamphlets would be, would be useful as we
begin to think about anti-Semitism a lot in our time. Mm -hmm. Sam, I see Jack has a question. I don't know if you yes. want to address that or how we Rahel want to. Rahel apparently thinks of disgrace not in the social sense dishonored, shamed, but rather in the spiritual sense that is out of grace, out of God's favor. Do you want to add something to that, Jack? I, 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 I'm sorry, it was just a thought because um, well, we, the, 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 you, were, uh, you were involved in the, this conversation around beauty and um, and I and uh, and along and in that in the passage where she talks about disgrace, I think mm -hmm. that um, there there is a, a, a an aspect of the entire as all of the, this, this whole chapter actually, um, which is um, uh, which refers back to the philosophical discussions of her mm -hmm. time. So that uh, this whole discussion of beauty, of course, is you know it's a romantic issue, right? What is beauty? And um, uh, uh, and and the relationship between beauty and truth, and so when she talks about being uh, being in disgrace, um, mm -hmm. I think she's she, I, I think part of what she's saying is that she is um, not only out of favor with uh, in, uh, with the people you know that people are putting her down and so on and so forth, but that somehow in disgrace she is she has really been uh, pushed out of the entire world that. That she that that um, there is something about her that has um, uh, um, uh, disallowed her entry into the world, to that she that she can't be part of the world because she is in disgrace because she does not have the the blessing to be part part of the world and I think this actually all of this actually connects to her Jewishness it's the you know it's not. Um, uh, it's the, that's always the subtext of everything that she's writing about. So when she talks yeah. about being ugly, she's talking about being Jewish. And when she's talking about being um, uh, socially uh, unacceptable, she's talking about being Jewish. Well, I think that it, it's present in everything that she's that she talks about, even though the, those words aren't spoken. Yeah, yeah. So. I, the, the the there are a couple things there. Um, I think pointing out the the intellectual climate in which um, that Arendt's talking about is really important. So when you have the so you ha you know you're in the midst of the kind of intellectual shift toward romanticism, and in you know uh, Coleridge and so on, their common sense, which Roger brought up earlier is explicitly juxtaposed to what is called folly and fancy, right? So, I mean, Arendt's making, and she, her, her, her reading of Rahel's attachment to beauty here is, can be read as Arendt's critique of the romantic tradition of the time in favor of common sense against folly, right? And against this kind of, and against whimsy towards facing the world. And I think that's a distinction, you know, that Arendt doesn't, she doesn't quite draw it in these terms in her later writing when she talks about loving in the world, but her idea of what it means to love the world is firmly grounded in common sense and not in folly. And the at, at the same time, I think when, um, you know, when she's talking about I, in that in the, in the, in that spirit, um, when she's talking about Rahel, when she, you know aren't thinking about what it means to be disgraced, not in the, you know, not in the social sense, right, but in the spiritual sense, it reminds me of Arendt's many discussions of the necessity of retaining inner harmony in order to retain the integrity of one's self in the world. Um, if we fall out of harmony with ourselves, then we lose our capacity to think and to judge. And this is one of, this is what in part I think makes Rahel, I'm going to use the word anti-hero from now on. I think this is in part what makes Rahel the great anti-hero in Arendt's schema of what it means to be a thoughtful human being engaged in the world of plurality, um, is that she, 
is that she turns she 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 she's incapable of, of of finding this inner harmony because she cannot accept who she is okay she is at odds with herself fundamentally and so she represents this kind of counter portrait of a thoughtful person who is engaged in a kind of common sense thinking who is oriented toward the world she feels so scorned by the world that she's on that she she's incapable of of finding that perspective of of, of common sense and so she's given to this romantic um fancy um which is which is prominent i think at the time at, at rahel's time at her time um this yes, wasn't yeah right. no go for it jack it's the era of beauty is truth and truth beauty. That's all you knew, know, and all you need to know. That's the era, right? And yeah. um, and in Rahel's case, I think there is, um, uh, she's also um, connected to this uh, idea of uh, what I, what, what I what later gets um, expressed as the eternal return. That is the evening, this evening is an evening that will always come back it, it doesn't go away, even though you wake up in the morning. The evening is still always there. It will come again, and uh, and that that uh, sense of living life, um, I think in her case, in the hope of living it again. But um, uh, but 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 unfortunately, she doesn't have that hope. She has despair, and so the way yeah. she sees the way she sees this the, the concept of the eternal return is that she is in some way cursed to be unhappy day after yeah. day after day, regardless of what she is exposed to. Yeah, that's well, funny. I just I just taught Zarathustra in our first year seminar program. So we've been talking about the eternal recurrence and this perpetual condition of at night. But it, I, you know, and this is part of the way that Arendt thinks about harmony of the self and retaining and truth and absolute and, and truth is retaining equanimity towards one's own experiences in the world, both the bad experiences and the good experiences, which for Nietzsche is necessary um, for, you know, embracing the eternal recurrence um, that you have, you know, if you've desired a moment of good another time, even once, then you've already embraced all the bad moments in your life. Um, and Rahel, is not capable of loving life that way. She turns, she explicitly turns away from, from that. Daphna, there's a, there is a book by an Israeli of German Jewish descent called The Pity of It All that explains much of the uniqueness of German Jewry at the time of Hannah Arendt and before. I think it helps to some extent to understand the zeitgeist. You wanna, you wanna, I haven't read the book, Daphna. Do you want to? Do you want to add to that what you wrote, or what helps to explain the what what in it you find helpful? Um, I don't have the book in front of me. I was going to look to to see uh, what names he brings up, but he talks a Kim lot. Kim says about, it's Amos Salon. Yeah, I, I have the I own the book and I forgot to write the name, um, but uh, I can't find it right now in my library here. Um, but he talks a lot about the uniqueness of this particular period, um, especially of Hannah Arendt, maybe less than of Rachel Farnhagen, but it explains maybe some of the struggle that German Jews had because they were so well assimilated. Um, and there's another book which is still in German, and uh, there is no current translation. It's called Ein Mercedes im Sand. And it was written by my father, who was also a Berlin Jew of exactly the same time as Hannah Arendt, and it's an autobiography. So it does kind of explain what the struggle of assimilated Jews were at the time to not be completely German, but to not be Jewish. I just thought it would be, if anybody has spare time. Yeah. I, uh, I just want to add to that. There's, uh, I mean, these are these are great books. There's also the the Deutsch Jüdische Parnassus, um, German Jewish Parnassus by Moritz Goldstein, written in 1912, which is actually a book Arendt cites quite frequently um, about the German Jewish experience, where he opposes both 
the Zionists and the assimilationists and uh, argues that you have to live as an eternal half other. Um, this Parnassus, German Jewish Parnassus. Um, and for those interested, uh, Sheila Ben Abib writes a fair bit about this book in her new uh, book, Exile, Statelessness, and something, which uh, will come out on our podcast in the next Amor Mundi podcast this weekend. So you'll be able to hear me talk to her about it uh, if you're interested. But um, the Goldstein book is, uh, or essay, not book, uh, German Jewish Parnassus, really develops this idea of a Jewish, of the Jew as a half, as always a half other, never either Jewish or German, but always both, and an eternal outsider um, that I think is very much in the idea of the conscious pariah in, in Arendt's work. Can I tell a short anecdote? Please. Sure. Um, I, have, I have a friend who's Catholic, and lately I have said that I think I want to join a, a monastery. And she said, oh, so you'll be a Jewish nun. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, even, uh, 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 <laughs> even if I join a monastery, I will forever be Jewish. Right. There's one at the end of my road, Daphna. You can you can come live by me. <laughs> A bunch of Jew, Jewish friends of mine want to form a monastery, and we're going to call it Our Lady of Perpetual Guilt. Oh. Can I jump in? Margaret, are you trying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, draw attention to, there's a two sentences um, at the top of, I have the same edition as you do. And it's page 97. It's a paragraph that begins on 96. But the last two sentences are, and it's talking about the love affair and or the love affair with love affair-ish, not necessarily the persons. But the sentences say, wanted to let herself be consumed, but she kept in reserve certain demands of the heart and proper desserts, which she merely, that was her lie. It's not possible to get rid of herself. And I mean, that, that really hit me over the head that this is, you know, that there is this recurring attempt to seemingly abandon herself into, okay, I'll marry the count and I will thereby get out of my social strata. But no, you take yourself with you. It sounds a little pat, but it explained a lot to me of why we were going through these affairs. And it also, I, a couple weeks ago, a couple of sessions ago, um, there was some disagreement as to whether she was, there was, we were reading the sections where she goes into Barnhagen's uh, despair and sadness over the lost love of the count. And some were saying, and I tended to agree, uh, that it wasn't altogether clear that it was really love that was going on. Um, this section, to me, explained a lot more. It was not involved with the objects of there, but was something entirely about trying to get away from herself, which is, after all, the ultimate assimilation. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, she says, so Arendt repeats this in this in these passages that you just pointed out, Margaret. Arendt, Arendt repeats this at least, at least twice, maybe three times in these two chapters and describing and describing what exactly it is Rahel is I don't know, experiencing, um, attaching herself to in these romantic relationships that she's having. And just below um, the set, the, the the two sentences below where you stopped, um, Lauren says, "Finally, she knew that she must provoke the no. That he was no longer a beautiful object, um, and not after having treated her basely, that his actions had gone far beyond anything she had originally wanted of him." that his behavior had more weight than her craving to be free of herself. 
that despair was as much part of this affair as death was a part of life. <laughs> um, it's pretty, I mean, that's pretty harsh. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, in, in terms of the judgment Arendt's making, but it's that he, he was no longer a beautiful object and he was no longer, he was no longer a beautiful object because of Rahel's desire to escape herself, right? And so she realizes, she thinks that by attaching herself to these beautiful objects, to these men that she desires, that she can liberate herself from herself. And when they stop being beautiful objects, she realizes that she hasn't liberated herself from herself and that that's what she wants more than the person that has been the beautiful object for her. So the men from Finkel's, Finkel's, was it Finkelstein? I'm forgetting, uh, without looking back, Finkelstein, you know, through, through Gens, through the Spaniard, all of these, these men are just, they, they become symbolically beautiful objects. And I think too, the, the, in the session that you're talking about, we were talking about you know, what exactly is this love that Rahel is experiencing? Well, it's not, it's not love in the sense that I think we would think about love or the way that Arendt wants to talk about love. Um, you know, Arendt talks about love in a few different ways, um, two ways distinctly that we can hold up in the context of reading this book. One is the way that she talks about it in the human condition, um, as, you know, the most apolitical of all human forces, because it creates such an intimacy between two people that it cuts off the world. And then there's the way that she talks about loving the world, um, which is very much embedded in the realm of, of, of social relations, of plurality of human affairs, and of accepting you know, the, the worst part of the world along with the best part of the world with this kind of equanimity in order to be fully human. And Rahel seems incapable of both, right? And it's somehow her rejection of the former kind of love, of intimacy, her, in, her inability to experience intimate love um, that in these two chapters ends up turning her away from the world so that the only thing Rahel can love is beauty itself, is the promise, which, which is the promise of escape. And so she ends up, I mean, it's, it's not a flattering, it's not a flattering portrait um, that she's so, in a sense, ego bound that she can't, she can't love anything at all, even herself. Yeah, it's worth it's worth recalling. You know, I mean, not only in the section on Finkelstein when RN says that Finkelstein's love um, opened no world for Rahel, right? Um, that it was worldless. Um, and that's very similar to actually what RN says about love in general, uh, in the human condition. Um, actually I was talking to Jerry Cohn about this after one of our sessions earlier when we talked about love and, um, in the human condition, RN says for love, although it is one of the rarest occurrences in human life, indeed possesses an unequaled power of self revelation and an unequal clarity of vision for the disclosure of who, precisely because it, is, because it is unconcerned to the point of total unworldliness with what the loved person may be, with his qualities and shortcomings, no less than with his achievements, failings, and transgressions. Love by reason of its passion destroys the in-between which relates us to and separates us from others, I mean, this is a this is a, an extraordinary passage that love has a self-revelatory character, but it's 
its power comes from the fact that it doesn't actually um, uh, concern itself with the loved one. Um, what we find in the loved one is what we put into them, and love is unworldly. Um, it's a passion that destroys the, the world, that separates us from others. Um, and that's the reason she says that it is apolitical and ant not only apolitical, but anti-political. Um, and the most powerful of the anti-political forces, because love draws us away from the world. And um, this text on Rahel and her loves, as Sam said, as she opened up the, the talk to the meeting today, um, is, uh, is a very deep exploration of the anti-political, the anti-worldly, anti-real uh, force of love, um, as I think Arendt presents it, whether we accept it. I mean, I, I, I think these are very controversial claims of Arendt's. Um, uh, you know, um, they make a lot of sense, and yet uh, to say that love is a self-revelatory, non-worldly, um, uh, passion that doesn't actually worry about the person loved is fascinating. I don't know. Do we accept, do, do people, do people find that accurate? Meaningful? Wrong? I find something very confusing about her idea of the reality and non-reality on page 96 um, at the bottom, the last paragraph about lying. Um, and she never let herself be consumed by Finkenstein because it had really been only a question of um, loving and being loved. But then she said she wanted to give herself away because she wasn't, she, she, she had to give herself up entirely. And she said, um, I lied in order to obtain a reprieve for my life. I lied. I did not declare the demands of my heart my proper des deserts. I let myself be suffocated. I did not want to let myself be stabbed. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure what she's saying there. <laughs> One kind of death is preferable to another, and by annihilating herself, it doesn't matter that she gives herself. I, it's very confusing. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to find the passage because I'm in a different text. I'm sorry. Is this near the end of the chapter? I think your text is about five pages ahead, page number wise. Um, it's one, five, so 96, 97. What? One, five, one, five, seven it is. One, one, five. Okay, one, five, seven. Um, in yeah she goes so that she goes on to continue talk, the passage i read about him no longer being a beautiful object she goes on to talk about um this lie this lying um after that um and she's connecting it to this to to this despair and death um um, if you could not choose death, you were foolishly depriving yourself of the freedom to die. When you would, you became then a mere animal creature whom death seized in the end. If you could not choose despair, you despaired nevertheless. Lies and lack of awareness accomplish nothing but the nameless humiliation of not doing consciously something that in any case would be done to you. And then she goes on to quote more. I mean, I think... You know, the way that I read these passages, um, in, in part, is this this lie that Rahel is telling, right, is she, you know, it is an acknowledgement of the extent to which she has divorced herself and her interest from the interests that she desires. So she, there's, I lied and order to obtain a reprieve for my life. I lied. I did not declare the demands of my heart, my proper deserts. I let myself be suffocated. I did not want to let myself be stabbed. 
cowardice. I wanted unhappy creature to protect the life of the heart. I simulated, I dissimulated, right? And it, I mean, to me, that creates the portrait of a person who is willing to change who they are or to try to change who they are in order to get the person that they think they want, even though you hit a point at which you are who you are anyway. So now you're not the person that you wanted to be with the person that you've gotten, so you can't be happy. And you've never been yourself with the person that you've fallen in love with. So you're a stranger to the person who's supposed to be your intimate. And this is this leads to this kind of sense of twisting, twisting, despair, right? And I think it just it's further evidence of the how alienated Rahel is from herself and from her own from her own interest, which is the underlying irony of this of this entire book and the you know this kind of passage at the end that we keep that we keep anticipating about her recognizing who she is but only at this moment of death um and it leads to a life of grief right the twisting the possibilities um you know there's this kind of forcefulness that rahel has that might be perceived as you know resilience or strength but it's her greatest vulnerability um, and weakness in Arendt's reading. It's what makes her unworldly. It's what makes her incapable of love. Um, I don't know if that does if that clarifies anything, Daphna. Um, <laughs> can I, can but, I ask you on the section Daphna was just talking about? Yeah. Um, it seemed to me the whole business about being suffocated as opposed to allowing oneself to be stabbed was as if you know, taking on some intense emotionalism in and of itself is fake because it's not actual emotion in which one would really dwell. If it's emotionalism or, you know, some sort of romantic ideal of emotionalism, not actually situated in the self where and then the real vulnerability to be bad would occur. I mean, that's, I don't know, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what I read it as. Um, I think that the uh, the twisting and twisting that she writes about um, uh, refers... You herself re vulnerable in that way. Jack? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, go for me? it. I'm Please, saying, yeah. I, I think that the twisting and twisting that she writes about uh, is descriptive is obviously a description of everything that we've been reading, which is that on the one hand she is admired, and on the other hand she is merely tolerated. On the one hand, she has no, she has a, a presence in the society that uh, that uh, that draws people of all kinds, while at the same time she is an outcast, and um, and I and this and she is continually twisting around this contradiction of who she is, both internally and externally. Although with the, the chapter, these chapters are written in terms of her specific individual love affairs or, or love, love connections, right? Um, uh, I think that's just, a, I, I don't just say just, but I think that's a way of um, concretizing this uh the twisting that that she feels all the time whether yeah. she is involved with a with a man or not um th there's a, a throwaway line you know daphne's story about the jewish nun reminds me that there is a, a, a really a throwaway line when um when uh Arendt reminds us that the that uh, this was a period where anti-semitism had a res resurgence in Germany, or or a new a new flourish a new flourishing in Germany, and um, mm -hmm. and so I think that uh, her uh, her sense of there in that in that uh, in in that description uh, when when Hannah raises that she says, uh, however, there were um, the anti Semites had good Jews. She was a good Jew, right? And um, and I think that uh, people who have um, uh, uh, grown up in an anti-Semitic environment have experienced that 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 sense of 
there are some people for whom, who will accept you because you're a good Jew. Right? You're one of the good Jews. You, in fact, um, uh, 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 I don't want to go into the story, but I, uh, 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 a person I know spoke of white Jews, right? You're a white Jew, um, an American, of course. Um, so uh, uh, this sense that she is tolerated but barely tolerated, that she is in the world but not in the world, that I, I think this is uh, um, what uh, causes her to go back and forth in her feelings about how she is going to connect to other people. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's the first part of what I want to set the, well, so I think the first part of what you said made me think of one thing, but then I, I think there's a lot to be said about the the good Jew and, and anti-Semitism that Arendt's reflecting on here. But there is, a, there's a kind of irony in reading Arendt, reading Rahel's life. Um, I think, you know, a few weeks ago, somebody asked if Arendt, you know, to what extent is Arendt projecting um, on Rahel judgments she's making about her own love affairs. And, you know, I think it's, you know, I, it's, uh, Arendt kept all of Heidegger's letters, right? And Heidegger got rid of all of Arendt's letters, like Rahel and Finkenstein. Um, you look at Arendt's Denktagebuch, um, her her journal, right? You look at um, the letters that she's writing with Heinrich um, and her letters with Heidegger. And she always retains, even I think in the great intimate moments and the playfulness that exists in her letters with, with her second husband, she always retains a kind of intellectual distance and she's reading Rahel here, who is really in the muck of her own feelings, who is twisting herself out on the page, bleeding every overwhelming thought, feeling, sensation, torment, desire, longing. And Arendt never does that. You look at her Dank Taga book, her thinking journal, and that's what it is, it's a thinking journal. I think about 50 or 60 80 pages in the first volume, that was the two volumes that were published by Peeper. Um, she has three pages on love and marriage in German. And they're very much intellectual reflections on love and marriage. And, you know, there's a great story of how Arendt met her first husband which I think Roger wrote something about for Quote of the Week a few years ago, you can find online um, about the chair, the bowl of cherries, I think it's called. Or so if you Google Roger Berkowitz and cherries, um, you'll find it. Um, <laughs> and you know, it has the, there's a little book that hasn't been translated into English, but you know, the way he, you know, he picked her up at a dance by making a joke about Kant, essentially. Um, you know, her, even her relationship with, with, with Heinrich was an incredibly intellectual affair. The, what I'm trying to say in part is that the great loves of Arendt's life were intellectual loves. They were people who, you know, she wrote to Jaspers that my second husband gave me a sense of history, right? If what Rahel is getting out of her romances is a feeling of the beautiful in the romantic sense, which removes her from the world. You know, Arendt is getting from her romances perhaps an expanded intellectual imagination. And I think that she, as a woman, if I may, understands love in a very narrow sense. You know, and I think it's a, it is complicated and it is contentious. Um, she takes, you know, in those those goopy feelings of love that Rahel so willingly, you know, writes out. Um, Arendt, um, you know, Arendt is much more reticent of. For her, there's this, there's the, her sense of privacy is 
so overpowering that it cuts her off from sharing private love with the world. Um, I was just rereading Arendt and Heidegger's correspondence and be, in part because of this book out of curiosity um, and thinking about how Arendt was approaching love. And there's this great moment where she runs into Heidegger on the train platform with her first husband. And it's the first time she's seen Heidegger after she's gotten married. Um, and it's like in 1931 or 32. So right before the kind of last letter before the war and before he becomes a Nazi. Um, and she says, you know, you're my father. Like, I will always love you. Do I have to speak of the love that's between us? And she describes Heidegger as her father, right? He's been this intellectual guardian in a way that's nourished her. And so I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure it's so much a, it's a direct corollary and projection between Arendt's love life and Rahel's, but I think in a certain sense, we have the anti-portrait of how Arendt thinks about intimate love in the figure of Rahel. And there's some, um, I mean, we can speculate about that, but I'm not sure it will, it will get us very far. There, Jennifer wrote, I find the idea of love being anti-political very interesting. It draws us away from the world. I think it's true. <laughs> 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 Do you do you wanna do you wanna add to that, Jennifer, or anyone else? Well, um, I'm hi everybody. I'm actually just curious as to hi, um, curious as to what kind of love she's talking about, um, in terms of separating from the world and and what um, Roger was mentioning about love being self-revelatory. I think one of the thing about one of the things I'm contending with in this chapter, and I don't know if this is kind of a stretch, is this the relationship between beauty as an escape, but also vanity in terms of looking at the world as a reflection, but in a sense isn't real. Um, so in terms of love being, like being kind of separating you from the world, is that, is that romantic love? And would Arendt say that, let's say, friendship is a love that is based more in shared reality, whereas romantic love is not? Discuss. Ro romantic love is shared, is based more on shared reality. So, so friendship love. You know, I think there in her letters with Mary McCarthy, there is a there is a greater sense of intimacy almost than there is, I find, in her love letters with um with her husbands um and Heidegger uh you know there's no question I think that Arendt values the intimacy of friendship um in a certain way and those those letters are very very worldly um in a certain in a, in a certain way they're talking about what McCarthy is writing and political events and speakers they're hearing and books they're reading and giving one another advice and there's this tenderness but I think when Arendt's talking about what it means to love the world she's thinking about I don't think she's yeah I don't think she's thinking about intimacy in that way that's not how I understand that conception of love um uh, let me can i add one or two things sam yeah please go for it so um yeah so first of all to back to jennifer i, I mean friendship for rn is worldly it's it's uh it's a respect it's a kind of non-passionate love an intellectual love for another as their as a citizen as a as a as a person who appears in the world and and, um, and so a friend is very worldly whereas lover yeah. is not um, I and so I think that's an important distinction you bring up Jennifer and, and one uh, and she talks a lot about friendship as sort of a 
I don't know if it's not a platonic love, but it's a, it's a kind of um, a love without the uh, passion that takes us away from the world. Um, the, the person who's written most about Arendt and love, at least according to that I know, um, is, uh, is um, Ms. Tummel. Uh, um, Tatiana Noemi Tummel, uh, and if you, if anyone has the, the book we I edited uh, with Ian Story, Artifacts of Thinking, last year, uh, about the Denk Tagebuch, she has an essay on love in RN's Denk Tagebuch, and in it, just just took a quick look, um, she identifies four different ways that RN talks about love, and it's just I'll, I'll, I can give you those, and then they can at least serve us for a, a discussion. The best known, she says, is the concept of love as worldless passion, which we've just been talking about in from the human condition. A less influential concept is love as eros, in the sense of Aristophanes' speech in Plato's Symposium, namely as a desire of what one is not. The precondition for eros, or desire, is plurality, and yet it is completely different from politics. So we desire um, what we are not, uh, not in the political sense of um, wanting to think from the other's point of view, but from, I guess, possessing that which we are not. Um, a third is the idea of amor mundi, um, uh, which is love for the world. And then, which is very different from, of course, a worldless, passionless love, uh, a passionate, worldless love. And then the fourth notion of love we find in Arendt is love understood as unconditional affirmation and its main source is the Augustinian volo ut sis, I want you to be. So um, uh, I think if we're if we look at those the only one that's close to the kind of intimate love that Sam is sort of talking about that Arendt she says is not there would be the, the symposium Eros which um, I think is the least apparent in Arendt's work. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, uh, but this would be at least a place to begin. Um, how, do you spell, how do you spell the name of the writer that you're referring to? Her name is 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 Naomi is Tatjana, T A T J A N A, and Tummel, T O Umlaut M M E L. She has a, a long book in German on. Arendt and Heidegger's concept of love, and then she has this shorter essay in English, uh, which is in the collection Artifacts of Thinking, which I edited uh, last year, and um, I know many of you have that book anyway, so you can, you can take a look at it. I, I want to, I just, I just uh, mentioned, this is the book Sam was talking about before, Die Kirchenschlacht, the the cher the cherry battle, and it's written by Gunther Anders, Arendt's first husband, and uh, it's uh, it's an account of the few years they did spend together as a married couple in Berlin, and um, there's some great stories in it for those of you who read German, and I've written a little bit about it as Sam says on the web. Go ahead, Sam. I know you were about to say something. No, 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 no. I just, I, that, that's great. I was just going to add, you know, I think one of the reasons reading Rahel Varnhagen is so interesting is because it's this um, pseudo biographical text that is discussing key philosophical concepts that Arne is poignantly talking about in her other works. And so we get you know, uh, we get a reading of beauty, we, we get a reading of love, we get a reading of despair and hope and optimism. And, uh, you know, Arendt isn't talking about Eros. Um, I think in the, you know, in her other works, but here we get um, you know, we get a sense, you know, through the other writings of other ways in which she's thinking about things that are too private to write about politically. I, for Arendt, there are some things that we don't write about politically. And I think um, this kind of, yeah, this kind of love is not something that she considered to be political. Yeah, Daphna? 
I was just intrigued by what Maria said a little bit earlier. I don't know if that's how you pronounce your name, but Maria <laughs> said earlier about vanity, because I think that there is a point here where um, Rachel wants to be loved, wants to be seen. She, it's, it's not otherworldly. I mean, her idea of love, not necessarily that, that love isn't otherworldly, but in this chapter, at least, or these two chapters, her search for love is really one of her searches, and certainly in the early part of the book, is to be loved and to be accepted. And there's an element there of she can only do that if she erases herself. She can only be loved if she's not what she is. And there is an element of, I think the vanity point is kind of, it kind of clicked. I think it makes sense to me that there is that element of how she is perceived is so important to her, or at least it is so important to her in Hannah Arendt's interpretation of Rahel. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, it sort of clicked when Maria said, Can I jump in? Yeah. Daphne, first of all, it is my name, Maria, so great. Um, on page 100 of our book, I guess, Roger, you're like five pages ahead of us. Um, Genst actually um, says this. Um, it's just in the middle of the paragraph on 100. Um, so I'll just do it then. It is strange that even the true man must in the end say, that he wantingly thrust away the best. And at bottom, is it not always the basis of all human vices, namely vanity, the senseless striving for appearance, which cheats us of the whole genuine reality of existence? So I just thought that that was a pretty evocative thing to say at sort of at the end of their kind of life, or at the end of his life, I think. Um, and then what we were talking about, uh, about the uh, reality and the flight from reality. Um, but the next thing that Hannah says, the next sentence, is, is something that I feel um, about the, just the talking about reality, which is, it is difficult to say which was the genuine reality. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if this resonates with anybody out there, um, but... I find it a bit confusing when we're talking about the flight from reality or, or, or just even what she means by that word. What is reality? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about that. Um, or the reality that Hannah, well, how she would kind of define reality. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier and common sense. And I think here in these two chapters, beauty is being held up against reality in a certain way, where reality is um, a kind of, reality is a kind of um, honesty and perspective with oneself and with one's relationship to the world around us. Um, you know, I, I think this idea of equanimity in relationship to truth and perspective attains throughout Arendt's writing from the way she describes homework, Homer um, as a great truth teller um, to the way that she um, thinks about uh, the way we pursue, we, we, the way we perceive um, even things that aren't um, moving um, at the end of the essay on truth and politics. Um, I mean, Aaron is making a judgment about what is real for Rahel, and I think that's one of the difficult things about this book. Um, I think that's one of the difficulties, at least for me, in reading her judgments about Rahel and her love life um, and, and, and who she is as a person. Um, she, Aaron, is clearly making a judgment that Rahel is betraying the world in favor of a different kind of reality, which is not reality at all. And that's a value judgment. Um, it's a philosophical value judgment about what is real and what is not real, and why Arendt's conception of the real is politically relevant to anti-Semitism 
Right. So I wanted I think, to I think part I, just to add one last thing. I think part of part, the way that Aaron's connecting that is that it is our turn away from the real and the common sense understanding of the real that allows us to blindly accept or play into uh, pernicious political propaganda um, like anti-Semitism. And that if we're able to look at the world this way instead, which is the real way, then we can better see where, um, to see what anti-Semitism is and so on. Susan? Yeah, I, I, I want to preface this by saying I, I have found so much of this very confusing and difficult to grasp. So, but um, when I read this, I'm constantly thinking about the precariousness of Rahel's life, not only as a Jew, but as a woman. We're talking less than 100 years after the witch hunts, in which Germany was one of the most, you know, uh, virulent places for that. And so the idea of being honest and open and true about who you are, I, I just find that concept as a woman at that time um, to be just not even a possibility. I mean, she has nobody there helping her. She has no family that's protecting her. Uh, so the idea that she would be able to be her true self and stand on her own two feet, uh, you know, it, it just, I don't see that in the context of this time at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it's the, I mean, it, it depends how we understand it. I mean, my understanding from reading those, you know, it, it is possible in a certain sense for women of a of an upper socioeconomic status. Um, uh, in part, with reference to what Susan brings up, um, yeah, I think that uh, uh, again we need to remind ourselves that we are here in the uh, in the midst of the Romantic period. And one yeah. of its one of its objectives, one of the objectives of people who are at the uh, at the vanguard, is self revelation, and uh, the uh, and self 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 revelation is a um, uh, a tenet of the uh, romantic romantic thinking at the period, and so it's not at all surprising that in intellectual circles or or salon that this should be encouraged both among men and women. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, and think, thinking about women at this time period, I mean, I, I, Jane Austen might be our, our go-to, one of our go-to critics of these kinds of women um, that Arendt sees in the figure of Rahel Varnhagen, where, you know, her, uh, you know, the character is held up as a kind of portrait of common sense against the, the, Oh, the, 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 the romanticism of the era. Um, I want to, we're running out of time and there are a number of comments that have accumulated in the chat box. So I want to get back to this, but maybe just to go through those and then we can, we can finish up how we want to finish up. Um, I, Jennifer wrote, I, oh, did we do that, Howard? Interesting, but I think it is not withdrawal to nowhere. I would argue that it is one way to explain experience the not yet the what the world can be and thinking about love and then Bob wrote Rahel sounds like something of an updated female young Werther <laughs> that's such a good book dramatic I'm happy other people read that book dramatic self-obsessed cloaking herself in chosen misery <laughs> though I would concede that she had as a friend of mine once reported a psychiatrist as concluding a reality problem well, there we, we have that judgment of reality again. I mean, I think I want to read the last two questions, but I'll, I'm just going to interrupt myself to say, um, you know, I think what Susan, what Susan Oberman is bringing up is another question of reality in relationship to the two senses of reality that we've been talking about them over the course of this conversation. Um, that in addition to Arendt's distinction between the kind of false reality that Rahel has concocted for herself and the reality of common sense that Arendt is holding up against Rahel, there's a, 
another reality perhaps where Arendt is unable to see the full reality of Rahel's life because of the perspective from which she's writing it. Um, and that this is a problem, this is a political problem. This is what, I'm, what I hear Susan saying, that this is a political problem of reality in the sense that the conditions of women in the late 18th century were radically different uh, than the conditions of, in the 19th, 20th century even. Um, and that, that Arendt does not appreciate the historical constraints that are uh, configuring Rahel's life choices, for lack of a better phrase. And I think that goes back to how we started the conversation today um, and the and thinking about the historical context in which Rahel is living and why this is really, you know, I think you could one could easily write a good chapter on Arendt's critique of of romanticism from reading Rahel Varnhagen. You know, her critique of Rahel is really a critique of romanticism and the way that it reconfigures reality, which is consistent with Arendt's critique of Enlightenment thinking as well, um, which opens her work on thinking in the life of the mind. And then just to read the last two. I'll let other people end the conversation. Jennifer wrote, I think love is a deep feeling for others that can, can't can be politically measured. Politically measured. I think any love that can be politically measured is not love. That's, that's my own opinion. Um, the idea of politically measuring anything makes the hair on my arm stand up. Um, so I think I agree with you, Jennifer. Um, Susan, Wrote, I, Olet, I think there is something very special, very powerful about writing through another's life. Arendt may write about love, beauty, and other large concepts in many texts, but she reveals something special about those concepts when she writes about how they are lived by a single other person. She prefigures what many contemporary writers achieve as they choose memoirs and other forms of life writing as their medium. Yeah. Um, we're living at a moment right now where memoirs have become one of the most dominant forms of, of, of writing, um, the, the perspective of the individual. But this, you know, I think this memoir that Arendt's writing through Rahel, as you say, is very, um, it, it pays attention to the particular um, in a certain material way, which is both confusing on the one hand, um, because she's making all of these leaps in reading about Rahel's life, um, but is also very enriching on the other because you see another, you see other sides of the way Arn is thinking about these co concepts, which are important for her work. Um, okay, are there last thoughts? I'm really enjoying this, even though it's very hard. It cut out from my end. I'm not sure where it where it kicked off there. Roger, I I don't, can you hear me? Jennifer, hi. Yeah, can I jump in? I really didn't want to read this. I don't know why. I just didn't. <laughs> but I'm. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, Good. But I've learned a lot about from this book. I've learned so much. It's really got me thinking and I kind of don't know where I'm going with my thoughts, such as I don't really know where I'm going with some of my written comments here, but I was really, it, it, I, food for thought, I guess, just use a stupid cliche. I like it. I'm so happy that <laughs> you have overcome the reticence and embraced yeah. Bart Hagen. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, this is a book of Arendt's that, for the most part, is not read um, compared to a lot of her other works, and it, it deserves more attention. Um, it's been, I, I, I was happy to reread it, but I've been surprised by how much I've gotten out of it in rereading it, um, and how much, and yeah. Roger, do you want to add any closing words? Uh, I I share that view. I've I was happy to reread it. I thought it would be fine, 
but I've enjoyed it, and I've I actually been writing a lot about it. Uh, I'm on sabbatical, as some of you know, and uh, I spent a good two weeks um, just writing about it um, because I found it. I mean, I think this this reality, this flight from reality, and this turn to introspection, uh, which I think. Sam rightly says, although I, I, I worry we can do too much with that as a critique of romanticism. Um, but I think it's very much comes back in the human condition in ways that are important. And, uh, and so uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I just want to ask, um, I saw Howard Goldson wrote that he had a lot of trouble with transmission today. I know Sam cut out once or twice, but otherwise it was good. Were there other people who had a hard time today or, or not? No, I'm in the UK and it's fine by me, so thank you. I could hear most of it apart from Sam, Sam's cutting out. But in yeah. Dell, Manchester, we're okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I couldn't hear Margaret, so other than that, it was pretty good. But I couldn't hear Margaret. I don't know if she was on the phone or something. It kept cutting out. Okay. I think, you know, it's it, obviously we're all on different internet connections and sometimes one goes or another. Um, we'll, we'll do our best. To, to to keep ours running well um but thank you all for next week we're reading again two chapters i i hope that's okay was it too much to read two chapters should i ask so we're not next week we're meeting on march 15th just to just to say that and assimilation which um assimilation is a short chapter but if we're going to get through this book in a semester, we have to sort of double up some of the chapters. Is that okay? Are people okay with reading two chapters? Okay. We'll see you in two weeks. Um, Thanks, everyone. Very much. Look forward to it and enjoy reading Hannah Arendt. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.